This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus is the way the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in him. Let's pray together. Good morning, Father. This is the day that you have made for us. Would you make us into the people that you want us to be for this day? Lord Jesus, you are the way that the Father has provided for us to come home in a relationship with you. And for that, we thank you. And we pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning as we gather in your name, receiving this day, receiving you. For your praise and glory. Amen. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'd like to begin reading the scriptures together, beginning in the Gospel of Luke, the eighth chapter, a brief passage where Jesus calms the storm, Luke 8, beginning with verse 22. <clears throat> One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the sea. So they set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and they were in danger. They went and they woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who is this that he commands even the winds and the waters? And they obey him. And then from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 4, Philippians 4, beginning with verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone, for the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. For our prayer time this morning, I turn to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation, and said they are a people who go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we declare that you are the Lord. You are the maker of heaven and earth. You are the ruler over the affairs, the affairs of the human race. And we thank you that that is true. For we live in very turbulent times. We live in times that are full of great 
threat. We, we live of in times of, of violence and rage and, and fear. And we need, to, we need to keep grounded in you. And so, Lord, we, we want to enter your presence. We want to enter your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. We want to come before you for your peace and your strength. Oh, Lord, we confess our dependence upon you and our utter need for you. Father, our minds turn to the events of these recent weeks and the violence in our capital and the inauguration this coming week and it, people who are making noise about increased violence and attack. And we would ask for your protection and for your mercy upon us your protection upon those who would lead us, your mercy upon us as you lead us forth. Oh Lord, we just, we bring all of this need, all of this situation to you. It is going to be only by your grace that we find a way to move forward. And we pray that you would grant us that. We do pray for President Biden as he takes office this week and Again, I would just ask, Lord, as he has promised to be a president for all the people, I ask that you would strengthen him to keep that promise and to truly be that. And I pray, Father, that you would guard us from those who would seek to destroy the things that are so important in our nation to us. Lord, we are continually mindful of the COVID issues, both here and uh, increasing around the world. Lord, it's in your hands, and we just ask for your mercy uh, through the vaccines, through people being responsible. Oh, Lord, would you remove this scourge from us? We seek that from you today. On top of that, Lord, there are, are so many other personal issues that we wrestle with and deal with. I know of two families uh, in my own relationships where, where they have lost uh, their matriarch. Uh, not, not so much lost her, but she's, she's gone from them and she's present with you. And that is a sadness for them, but it's also a joy because those two women are, are no longer suffering here. They are rejoicing in your presence and we thank you for that. But many, Lord, are dealing with the loss of loved ones. Many are dealing with major health issues. Many are dealing with so many struggles in their lives. And we just want to pause and ask for your provision for them today and ask for your mercy for them today. If there are ways that we can reach out to bless and to love and to care, would you show us even now? Lord, we thank you for your provisions. And we ask that you would hear us as in this moment of quiet, we would offer to you those things that are in our hearts now. Hear us, O oh Lord, we ask. Lord Jesus, thank you for welcoming us before the throne that we might ask of our Father, that we might ask of you. And we thank you that you are interceding and praying for us as well, right, right alongside of us in all of our need. Oh Lord, would you, would you make that a great comfort to us today? We ask in your most precious and holy name. Amen. Well, my heart has been thinking a lot about the passage that we shared last week. And uh, in fact, I had the, the great privilege of speaking with a few folks this week and, and sharing the passage with them. Uh, it was a conversation about some different things, but we came upon a, some struggle and some concern. And it just came into my heart that what they really needed to hear was this message from the Lord. And I offer it to you. 
And if it helps you uh, receive it this morning, maybe just pause, bow your head, close your eyes, and, and just listen and allow the Lord to speak this to you today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. Oh, friends, those are not just empty words. Those are rich, rich words. And as we spoke last time, they were words that the Lord gave to his people at his own initiative. The way of his peace, the way of his blessing, the way of his provision. And, and it's my heart's desire that you know and experience and walk in the peace and the blessing and the presence of the Lord. What was a an encouragement in reading those verses became a discouragement as I was reading on a little bit further. Because from Romans or from uh, Numbers chapter 6, you enter into uh, chapter 7 and they're getting the tabernacle ready. They're consecrating all of the elements of the tabernacle. Uh, and then the, the cleansing of the Levites, they are getting ready to be able to be empowered in service. And then in uh, Numbers chapter 9, they celebrate the Passover together. And, and it is just a year since they had left Egypt after the Passover and going through the Red Sea and then wandering through the wilderness until they came to Sinai. And they had been there. It's now one year and they're getting ready to celebrate Passover again. And it, as I do things that remind me of something that happened before, I can, can kind of relive some of those experiences before. And it's only been a year. And so I wonder what it was like in their hearts and their minds as they sat down for the Passover, not having to rush, not having to, to leave very quickly, not having to worry about the angel of death passing over, but as the act of deliverance that by, by the blood of the lamb shed for them, they were spared the angel of death, and then they were set free from captivity in Egypt. They were set free from their bondage. The, the nation had been there for 430 years. We don't know how many decades they had been in slavery. Uh, it had been a while, but we don't know exactly how long it was. It wasn't clear in the scriptures. But long enough that they cried out for deliverance, and God showed up, and he answered, and he gave them that deliverance. And so he led them out of Egypt. He led them to the edge of the Red Sea, where Moses parted the way and led the whole nation through the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army was destroyed. He led them for uh, a few months through the wilderness, the Lord providing for them water, the Lord providing for them the manna, uh, the food for them to eat day by day. And then he brought them to Sinai, where, where they were so awed and terrified by the presence of the Lord smoking on the mountain. And Moses received all of the instructions from the Lord. He received the covenant, the agreement that you know, God's promise that he would be their God. And they received the way God wanted them to promise to belong to him. And that was partly through the, the receiving of the commandments. That was the covenant that the Lord had made with them. And the where we came to last week was the time around Sinai was getting ready to come to an end. And they were getting ready to enter into the journey that would take them to the promised land. And the Lord gave them this blessing that we read just a moment ago and that we focused on last time, not simply as a benediction on what had gone before, but, but as launching words, as words that would prepare them and send them off as they would go towards their new home. And so after the celebration of the Passover, they start to assemble. And in the thousands of them, got together in formation, and they got ready to step off. In Numbers 10, verse 11, it was the second year, the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel began to set out. They blew trumpets, and they started to walk, and as they began, if you look at the end of Numbers 10, in verse 35, whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, let those who hate you flee before you. I have to think that there were a lot of goosebumps the day that they first walked out, the day that they had been waiting for, and, and they had been once 
just led out from slavery, and now they were God's people, and they were going to be on the march to God's land. But oh, how things change. Numbers 11. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt, and it cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic— but now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. What a transformation. From, from the glories of the benediction to send them forth, and Moses getting ready, and they go off into the wilderness for just a few days, and in just a few days, it's like they forgot absolutely everything. And they started complaining. And that was not acceptable to God. Their complaining was not acceptable to God. Their, their grumbling was not acceptable to God. Their wailing was not acceptable to God. Their dissatisfaction with God was not acceptable to God. I have been troubled at the tone of life around us over these last months. Perhaps you have also. There has just been this tone of malaise, this tone of anger, this tone of grumbling about everything, this tone of discontent, this tone of hatred and violence and rage that came to a head a week or so ago on the day of the certification of the election. And people are making noises about, about more uh, uprising uh, in, in a few days. And my heart is highly troubled. One of the pieces of why my heart is highly troubled is, you know, God's people, some seem to be mixed up in all of this and, and contributing to some of the trouble and some of the struggle. And as I, as I read in Numbers and I see God's desire to bless his people, I also see a warning. It, it, there are things that we must not do if we want to walk in God's blessing. And we see that right here in chapter 11, the people rose up and complained. The people rose up and the people murmured. The people were not satisfied with what God had wanted for them. And as you read through the account of Numbers and Deuteronomy, you see that that prevented them from entering into what God had planned for them. And what I would offer for yourself and myself today is that if we are going to walk in the blessing of the Lord, if we are going to walk in the peace of the Lord, stop complaining, stop murmuring, stop grumbling, and trust the Lord. And in this passage, some of it is sort of unspoken and in the background, and we see a picture of how you and I can remember, how we can, how we can move forward. The people complained because they forgot, and they had a bad tendency to forget. Now, you, you and I don't forget anything that the Lord's done for us, but they, they had a bad, bad tendency to forget. And the, the true way to move forward into the blessing and the presence and the peace of the Lord is to remember. The people had forgotten to look back and remember all that the Lord had done for them. They had forgotten what he had done for them, and that kept them from doing what they needed to do. Well, what had the Lord done? Well, we spoke. It had been a year since they had been set free, and, and they had been set free from hundreds of years in Egypt to go on to their new home, and, and they had they had forgotten the plagues that they were delivered from. They had forgotten the Passover, even though they had just celebrated it. They had obviously forgotten what God had done to set them free. They forgot his protection. They forgot walking through the Red Sea. They forgot the water, and they hated the manna. 
And so they, they deeply forgot what God had done for them. Have you forgotten things that the Lord has done for you? When we forget the things that the Lord has done for us, it really changes how we look at the things that are going on because we don't think about him really being able to do anything now because we don't remember what he's already done. Think back over the last year of your life. It has been a big challenge. It has been perhaps one of the most challenging years in your life. Uh, 10 months ago this weekend, as uh, we look back to things kind of closing down and, and all of the COVID things and the financial things and the social things and the political things that have been happening. But the Lord has been with us and the Lord has come alongside of us. But even beyond that, and you think of what the Lord has done, think back to your life around the time that you came to know Christ. Think of what your life was as you were growing up, whether it was good and blessed or whether it was a struggle and awful. Think of you and your character, the choices that you made, the wrongs that you did, um, the, the rights that you did. But just think of your life. Think of who you were when you met Jesus and you yielded your life to him and he saved you and he delivered you. And begin to think of, of the provisions that he's, the people that he has brought into your life, the prayers that he has answered, the ways that you have seen him transforming you, the, the direction that he has given you, that has brought you to the place that you are now. One of the things that helps to keep us from complaining about the situations that we find ourselves in is looking back at the goodness of God that we have experienced and giving thanks, making a list of the things that God has done and thanking him for that. That takes the power out of complaining about the things that are going on around us now. And it helps to minimize the fear of the things that are going on now. Have you forgotten things that the Lord has done for you? It's a good time to remember. And if Israel had remembered what the Lord had done for them and that had affected how they faced that challenge, uh, life would have been much different for them as a people. But don't just look back with thanks at what God has done for you. Look forward for the hope that God has promised for you. One of the things that Israel still really didn't know yet and and. Yes, there's fault, but in some ways they were still young in, their, in this area of faith. They didn't really know who God was. They didn't really know how when he said something, he really meant it. You can look back and find several instances where the Lord says, I am going to be bringing you to Canaan and I'm going to settle you there. That is going to be your inheritance. That is where you're going to live. I'm going to bring you there. Well, I don't think they thought much about him actually doing it. I think they thought that's what he was saying. They didn't realize that if he said it, it was going to happen. That's why I selected that little passage from the Gospel of Luke this morning, because as Jesus and his disciples got into the boat, Jesus said, let's go on over to the other side. And you know what happened. He fell asleep and the storm came and they were worried about the storm capsizing the ship. He woke up, he calmed the waters. He said, why, are you, why didn't you believe? And he said, we're going to the other side of the lake. He meant that they were going over to the other side of the lake. There wasn't anything that was going to hinder that. Nothing was going to keep him from getting there. They just didn't know him well enough to know that he said it, he meant it. And so we're going to be there okay. Um, his, the, Israel didn't know that when God makes a promise and he says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. And so they didn't trust him for them in their past. They didn't trust him to be able to deliver them to where they were going. One of the promises that you and I have as believers in Christ is Paul's words in Philippians 1.6, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. 
In other words, he began a work in you. He is holding on to you. He is not going to let you go. He is going to complete that work that he has in you. And as you're walking through the day, no matter what's taking place, he is not going to let you go. I will never fail you nor forsake you. He is going to work to complete that work to make you like Jesus. And so we can develop a heart that is not a complaining and grumbling, murmuring heart with today because we remember who God is and what he's done for us in the past. And we remember what he's promised for us and we trust him for it. We hope him in him for the future. And so therefore, we can begin to look at today through an eyeglasses of peace, through the spiritual vision of peace and God's blessing for us. We said, as we began our time together, today is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That verse is from a section of the Psalms called the Egyptian Halal. It's Psalm 118, verse 24. And as a part of the Passover celebration, there would be singing, and they would sing from this section of Psalms. And this particular psalm is the last psalm in uh, in Psalm in the Egyptian Halal. And I remember hearing someone speaking about this and, and, and picturing the upper room and Jesus with his disciples and having their meal together, having the, the special communion time together, singing their songs and coming and hearing Jesus saying these words, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. What is the day that he would be referring to? It was the day that was going to come in just a few hours when he would mount the cross and he would hang there for your sin and mine. Jesus was able to look at his present in the eyes of the power of his father who was faithful to him through his whole life, through all of history, bringing him to that point, who, who was leading him to the cross, would lead him through to the resurrection and to the exaltation until Jesus comes back. Jesus was able to look at his then and now, his here and now, his, his that present time through that lens and was able to continue to trust God even though it was leading to a cross. The words refining come to mind as, as the Lord is a refiner of us. He is a fuller soap washing us and cleansing us. He is the, the potter who shapes us as clay. He, he disciplines us. He allows the waters to come but not destroy us. He allows the fires to come but not destroy us. All for the purpose of our transformation because we've learned to trust who he is, even in the midst of the things that we do not understand. And so it would have made all the difference in the world for Israel had they, on that day, on Numbers 11, just a few, few days after the blessing that the Lord gave from Aaron, after their Passover, if they had been able to look back at the last year, at all that the Lord had done, and instead of complaining, just talk to him. If they had been able to look ahead at the promise and rest in him, if they had then been able to see their lack of food, their lack of, of what they wanted, and actually been able to trust him. That's the big picture. But in addition to the big picture, there are just a couple of of specifics as far as how you and I can move beyond the feelings like we really just want to complain and gripe and mumble about the things that are going on in life. And, and the first is that the scriptures give us the encouragement and the permission to call out to the Lord, to call out to him, to, to seek him, to, to pray, to cry out as you read in the different Psalms I was thinking of Psalm 63, earnestly, oh my God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. Uh, there's a sense of just really crying out 
and calling out to the Lord in our struggle. And we have permission to do that. The Psalms are a great resource for you and I to call out to the Lord. He doesn't turn away a voice that calls out to him. In fact, in, in 1 Peter 5, it says, you know, cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. So the invitation to exchange complaining for praying. But in that praying, don't be afraid to be honest and tell God how you're hurting. Don't be afraid to be honest and tell God what you're feeling. Don't be afraid to be honest and tell God what you're afraid of and, and what you're concerned about. Pour out your heart to him. And even better than just doing it on your own, do it with someone else, maybe with your spouse, maybe with your pastor, maybe with another Christian friend or somebody that, that you know would come and they would agree with you and they would seek the Lord for you. And, and they might pray for you in your presence to help you also lift up your heart and your voice to the Lord. You can be real with the Lord about these things in your lives. Um, Greg Groschel, in a, a webinar that I had seen about thriving in this new year, had a number of different points about strategies that you and I as believers can use to do that. And, and one of them was embrace the pain, don't complain. Don't deny that it hurts. Don't deny that it's painful. Embrace the pain. Confess it. Receive it. Embrace the pain, but don't complain. He says this, comfort never made me to be more like Jesus. Yeah, comfort doesn't transform our lives to be more like Jesus, but rather it's the pain of struggle. It's the pain of discouragement. It's, it's the pain of worry and hurt and heartache because it's then when we choose to respond as Jesus is shaping us to. And so we embrace the pain and not complain and we can pray to the Lord for his strength. <clears throat> One of the other ways that you and I can specifically act, 2 Corinthians 10.5 talks about taking every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Thoughts, boy, our thought lives, they can take us to terrible places. It was out of the thoughts of the heart that the people complained in Numbers chapter 11. It was out of the thoughts and the feelings and the things that were going on in their heart and the things that they were not, they were the untruths that they were believing about God that caused them to complain. Paul, we read in Philippians chapter 4, and he talks about thinking about the things that are true, the things that are honorable, things that are just, pure, lovely, commendable, things that are excellent, things that are praiseworthy. Think about these things. When our minds want to go into a bad place and we find the anger growing, we find the stress multiplying, we find our mouths wanting to just, just let out all of this in, in, a, in a bad, bad complaint, go back to God's word and refresh your mind in the things that are true in the things that are right, allow it to speak to your mind and to cleanse and to think about those things. I'm not telling you to try to just stop thinking those negative thoughts. Replace those negative thoughts. Think about other things that just cause those negative thoughts to be lifted up and pushed out of your understanding. Think about those things. All of those things will help you and I as, as we seek to move past the sense of, of complaining, of worrying, of struggle. As I was thinking about this passage from Numbers, you know, the, the context of life really makes all the difference. And the, the context of that passage makes all the difference. I saw a few photos this week that, that bring that to mind. I'd just like you to picture a couple things in your mind. I'd like you to picture, first of all, a lioness and her cub. And the lioness has the cub's head in her mouth, just totally in her mouth. And the cub is just kind of hanging there, you know, hanging. Well, that's one picture. 
But then when you when you rotate it around 180 degrees, you see, no, she doesn't have his head engulfed in her mouth. She's holding him by the scruff of the neck, just like they do. But one picture shows you one thing. The other shows you the reality. Context is everything. A second set of pictures. Imagine a streetscape. There's a man kneeling over someone, doing violence to his body. There is blood everywhere. And the man on the ground looks like he's being decimated. And then the camera has moved back and it gives you the broad picture and it's a movie set. And you realize that nothing bad is actually happening. It's just happening for a movie. Or the last one, and I've seen this particularly one with, with COVID things, Sometimes you will see a picture of a great crowd and they're all together. They're all very, very close together. Nobody's wearing masks and you're, you're worried about, about COVID spreading. And it's a, a condensed picture that removes space. I don't know the specifics or the technical aspects of how that's done, but, but it removes space. So it looks like everybody's close together. But then when you see what the picture is really like, everybody's well over six feet apart. They're all spread apart. Uh, there really isn't a problem at all. Context is how it just it makes you see things in a different way. For Israel in Numbers 11, the context was their pain was all that they could see. And they had forgotten what had come before. They were not thinking about what God had promised. And so it made them look at what was happening around them with anger, with fear, with doubt, and they lashed out at God, and, and they ultimately paid the price for that. Friends, the, the context, think of what God has already done for you. Think of what his promise is for you, so that you can receive today as the day that he has made. And I'm not going to promise you that it will have no struggle. It, I can't promise you it will have no disappointment. And as we look ahead to the next year, these coming days, these coming weeks, I, I would like to say we would get to a place of smoother sailing, of getting back to ways things have been before. But that's not my promise to make to you. But I do have the promise that God has made the days ahead. God has a plan for the days ahead. And God is strong enough to make that plan happen. And so friends, as, as you look back with gratitude, as you look ahead with hope, you look now with confidence and trust. You pray, pour your heart out to God, talk to him, and you allow his word to transform your thoughts. And as you engage in that, you are going to be able to receive more and more of the blessing because you will experience that the Lord is smiling down on you even while you're walking through the events that you're thinking about. And you'll have a sense of growing peace in your heart because you're trusting that he's in control. He's at work in your life. He's using things to make you more like Jesus until the day that he calls you home. And you trust him for that this morning? I hope so. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we confess that as we look at our own lives and our own hearts, too many times our hearts are, fill are filled with the discontent and the, and the complaining spirit that we read about. Lord, we don't want to miss the experience of your blessing. We don't want to miss walking in your peace. And so would you remind us, continue to remind us to look back with joy and gratitude over all of the ways that you've been at work in our lives, all of the things that you have done that we did not expect. We would look ahead and trust you for the promise that you have made to bring us home and make us like Jesus. And that through those two glances, we would be able to look at the things that are surrounding us now and we would trust you and we would serve you. 
And we would invite others to come and to know your peace and to know your presence. Lord, we thank you for that today. Strengthen us now. Renew that blessing in our hearts, in our lives, not just this day, but every day that we would walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us this morning. The song that I have selected that immediate is designed to immediately follow the message is a song about all of our days belonging to the Lord. And all of our days being days that we can trust him in and follow him. And, and uh, I hope that you'll uh, go there and enjoy that together and that it will uh, bless you. May the Lord strengthen you. May the Lord make you a blessing to others as you go forth and follow Jesus this week. In his name, amen.